Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon, and this week is February 26th through March 3rd of the Come Follow Me program associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we are studying the Book of Mormon this year in 2024. So one of the topics that we are focused on this week for Come Follow Me, it is the topic of life in the millennium, which makes sense since life in the millennium is going to be a little bit different than what we're experiencing right now. In fact, I would say it's pretty similar to what the eternities will be like, right? So there is a verse that is given that talks a little bit about what life will be like in the millennium. So this is 2 Nephi, and it's chapter 12, and it is verse 4. It says, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, this is really awesome, right? We're very excited about this. There's not going to be any war. They're going to get rid of all of their weapons, and they're going to turn their weapons into useful tools, right? Tools that build and create rather than tear down and destroy. So this is all wonderful. We're all excited about this. So one of the things I was actually thinking about when I was thinking about this verse was the Book of Mormon war heroes, specifically Captain Moroni. Now, Captain Moroni was really good at war. <laughs> he spent a lot of time with war. He invested a lot of energy into war, and he was really, really good at it. There is a verse, however, that gives us a little more insight into Captain Moroni. So this is Alma chapter 48, and it is verse 11. It says, And Moroni was a strong and a mighty man. He was a man of perfect understanding. Yea, a man that did not delight in bloodshed, a man whose soul did joy in the liberty and the freedom of his country and his brethren from bondage and slavery. Now, why is this significant? <laughs> Moroni was really good at war, but... It wasn't war that brought him happiness. What brought him happiness specifically was the liberty and freedom of his country and his brethren from bondage and slavery. Now, this is really under important to understand because if when Moroni arrived on the other side or if the millennium had occurred during Moroni's time, Moroni was the kind of man who could find happiness in the context of of eternity. So he lived according to the realities in life, war. However, he aligned himself with the realities of eternity, which means no war. He participated in war, but he loved the freedom of his brethren. He had become the kind of man who could be happy in eternity. If he had loved war, there wouldn't have been a lot of happiness to find on the other side, right? So the warning is this. Will we be happy with our pruning hooks? <laughs> when our weapons weapons become obsolete, will we be happy with the pruning hooks? Now, I'm going to take a wild guess that most of us are not professional soldiers. However, there are plenty of mortal desires that are not compatible with eternity. <laughs> it's not just that the weapons will be beat into plowshares, right? It's all sorts of mortal desires will suddenly become obsolete in the millennium. And will we be the kind of people who will be content with what the realities of this millennium with the eternities are? What are our desires what makes us happy, what fuels our decisions and makes us feel fulfilled, what makes our work, our work feel worth it. Now, the interesting thing about mortal desires is that they really can bring a measure of happiness in this life, right? But the doctrine that is absolutely essential to understand is that these mortal desires have an expiration date, <laughs> And we, we don't want to find ourselves empty when those desires are no longer able to be fulfilled because we are in the eternities rather than mortal life. So I came up with a two-step process, not much of a process because there's two steps, but there's two steps that we can take to kind of check ourselves, I guess, gauge whether we are the kind of people who are going to find happiness in the eternities and so we can start to work more and more and more and more towards becoming the kind of people 
who when we get to the other side or when the millennium descends, we find plenty of fulfillment, right? And the first one is to make a very honest list of what our desires are. Now, this can be difficult to hold a mirror up to yourself and look at what really fulfills you and what's bringing your happiness, right? Moroni, you look at him, he's really good at war. It would have been easy to assume that that's what made him happy, but it was the freedom of his brethren that made him happy. We need to be able to look at ourselves and make an honest list of what our desires are, what makes us happy. And it's better to do that here than it is to do it on the other side so that we can work towards becoming the kinds of people who can be happy in eternity because becoming is a long process. It takes a while. Now, side note to this, in order for this to be effective, in order for this process to be effective, in order uh, for us to work towards becoming the kind of beings that exist happily in eternity, this particular step in which we list our honest desires, it requires kindness towards ourselves. There's no reason to beat ourselves up as we're writing down some of our mortal desires, right? We all have less than perfect desires. We all have some mortal desires, right? There's no reason to beat ourselves up over it. We know that part of overcoming these desires, that process of overcoming those less worthy desires are actually contributing factors towards us becoming like our Heavenly Father. We also know that Christ paid the price for us to have this experience so that we could become like our Heavenly Father. We don't have to beat ourselves up over these things. We, honestly, the best way to do it is to try to be as objective as possible as we're making this list so we can look at it and know where we need to go from there. So what are our desires? What... It's easy to write all the right answers, right? Like we desire our family and all these things. But I want you to think about for a second, what occupies your thoughts for a majority of your day? What do you think about before you're falling asleep? What do you think about when you're waking up? And these might not all be like perfect indicators of what our true desires are, but they can give us a little insight into what some of our desires are. So how do you spend your free time? How, what are you sacrificing for something else, right? Now, this one is actually really interesting because we can take it a step further. So to give you an example, so we can understand what I'm trying to say here, do you sacrifice your family so that you can provide or are you sacrificing for your family in order to provide? Might seem very nuanced and silly, but it's really, really important, right? Because that's going to play out differently in eternity. If you're sacrificing your family and just trying to make money, you're going to find yourself a little bereft in eternity, right? But if we're all going to have to make sacrifices in order to take care of our families. But if your desires lie with your family still, you're not going to find yourself so empty in eternity. Now, it is also really, really important that we be specific. So for example, when you're making your list, you might write just money in general, right? But it is really important to be specific. So for example, when you're writing money, is it the prestige that makes you happy? Or is it the freedom to be able to do what you want, right? What aspect, what facet of money is what makes you happy? Because those two different facets, those two desires are actually going to play out differently in eternity. So as we're going through this step one, of trying to become the kind of person who's happy in eternity, we need to be specific and really get to the root of what we desire, of what drives us and makes us happy. Now, step two, you look at your list of desires and things that make you happy, and you literally place them in the context of eternity. So it's really difficult to try and explain this principally or to try and cover a bunch of examples. So I'm just going to cover one example of a desire. We're going to place it in the context of eternity together so that you can do it to your own desires. <laughs> now, we've already been talking about money. It's very practical. It's very concrete and easy to understand. So we're going to keep talking about this idea of money, right? Placing money in the context of eternity. Now, Captain Maroni as I mentioned previously, lived according to the realities of his mortal life. There was war. He needed to protect his people. He lived according to those realities, but he became the kind of man who could be happy in the eternities. This can also be applicable to something as simple as money. 
So what are some of these truths about eternity that correlate with money? So for example, number one eternal truth that is vaguely attached to money. On the other side, everything that is his will become ours, right? And even if you don't go to the celestial kingdom, I'm assuming that your basic needs are likely going to be met, right? And so if you're working, 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 and that becomes your the main facet of your personality, just trying to provide and trying to make money, make money, make money, when you get to the other side and all of a sudden all your needs are provided for, are you going to be like, okay, well, now what do I do, right? Who are you going to be without that facet of yourself? Number two, eternal truth. That relates to money. There's no prestige over your brethren and sisters on the other side. It's just, it doesn't really exist. We're all on the same level. And so that particular cistern of joy dries up very quickly. (laughs) If you are enjoying specifically the prestige of money where you like people looking at you and being pressed with you for your money, it's going to be very difficult (laughs) to find happiness in that way. On the other side, it's just, it doesn't work. (laughs) It's like it's non-existent in eternity. So number three truth that I want to talk about that correlates with money. What are you sacrificing? Are you spending sufficient time? Because we're all going to have to sacrifice some of our time in order to take care of our families. But are we spending sufficient time with our families that we find, that we personally are the type of people who find joy within our families? Because on the other side, a majority of joy that there is to be felt will be found within your family and friend relationships. So are you the kind of person that can tap into that kind of joy? Is that the kind of person that you are? And it's really important to note that this is an an internal question, right? There are people out there with three jobs who have to sacrifice a ton in order to be able to provide for their families, but the whole time they're wishing they were with their families compared to someone who probably doesn't need to, but they might be be at work all the time because they're like, oh, my family doesn't need me. I don't really need my family. I'm just going to keep making money, right? There's a difference there in how it will play out in eternity. We have to place our desires in the context of eternity and see if they align with everlasting reality. See if we are the kind of people that can exist happily in eternity. Now, this might seem very practical and straightforward. (laughs) However, our desires are likely going to vary day to day, right? Some days they'll be compatible with eternal realities and then other days they might be a little more shallow, right? The key is to continuously nurture our eternal desires so that when mortal life ends or when the millennium descends, we are not left bereft. And the way to do this is to understand the true nature of things, to understand the true value of things, to look at it in the context of eternity, see what it's actually going to be worth, and then to invest in the most important things. I am grateful for my Heavenly Father and my Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave me this mortal experience so that I could grow. I am grateful that He also warned us that eventually weapons would become obsolete, that they would be turned into pruning hooks, so that I could look at myself and observe whether I'm the kind of person who can find happiness in eternity so that I can change to become like them so that I can find happiness in eternity. I am grateful for my Savior who paid the price for me to make that journey to become like them so that I can find happiness in eternity. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.